Nadia, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, Nadia, look, you be, you're super active on, on Twitter. Uh, I've been reading some of your posts, but I guess uh, a lot of my audience uh, will not know you. Uh, we're always trying to reach new audiences as well. So in like very, very quickly, who are you uh, and what makes you tick? Uh, yeah, I'm Nadia. I'm a writer researcher um, working independently, but I like finding really interesting problems that people haven't uh, haven't figured out how to describe the problem itself yet, I guess, maybe is one way of saying, mm -hmm. um, you know, in that sort of um, super early stage of trying to form like early questions about how, what what is this thing and how does it work? Um, so I really like finding interesting problems to just dig in on and try to solve them, um, usually around trying to understand how people work in some shape or form. Um, spent a lot of time looking at um, open source developers and open source software and looking at how that works. Um, and yeah, now looking at a variety of other, other things. Do you come from a technical background or more of a more human sciences um, background? I didn't so study. Yeah, I don't know. I, I yeah. didn't. Um, so you don't know. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> dabble in a little bit of everything. Um, everything. But no, I, I've never worked professionally as an engineer, I guess. Um, I'm mostly mm -hmm. just interested in the people behind technology. Yeah, when I got involved in open source, and which is why I ask, I mean, when I got involved in open source, I came from a fair and square engineering background, but there were a lot of people, uh, you know, I got, I got involved in university. There were a lot of people in, you know, the philosophy department, the social, social sciences and et cetera, that took an interest in open source because it can be seen that way. I mean, it, it's first and foremost a social movement, right? And, and it, it's a mixture between the technology, which is why I loved it, which is why I always yeah. loved it. Yeah, that's what I find kind of fascinating about it. Once yeah. I realized, I mean, I didn't, once I realized there was something interesting about open source to look at, I remember thinking, mm -hmm. okay, but I'm not an open source developer. This this yeah. whole thing is like very obscure to me. Am I even the right person to be looking at this? But I just thought the stories were so interesting and it's um, and it's this thing that underpins everything else that we do in, in technology. So mm -hmm. it felt strange that more people weren't talking about it or writing about it. Mm -hmm. And where are you physically today? I am physically in Los Angeles, um, where oh, I nice. spend the summer yeah. with my family. Um, so we're in Manhattan Beach, kind of further down south. Um, it's really cute. Like when I say I'm in LA for the summer, people assume it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're partying in West Hollywood or something. It's not like that at all. It's very <laughs> like cute little beach town, yeah. um, very quiet and, and sleepy and um, very family oriented. It's really nice. That That's, that's so cool. Uh, look, and when, when I announced that I was going to do the podcast, just for, for my non-repeat viewers, somebody who could be joining for the first time. I was an atheist for 20 years. Right? So just, uh, and for the most part of 20 years, we, we, we can go into more details later, but I, I had this very low impression uh, of, of religious people, which I guess a lot of people do. Some people may not say it, but uh, it, it's a fact in the industry. I think a lot of people think very lowly. Uh, you know, why would you believe those, those fairy tales? And, uh, and when I announced that I was going to do this and, and, and I want to have those conversations, your, your name immediately came up, right? So people say, hey, you should talk to Nadia, you should talk to Nadia, and which, again, I'm happy, I'm happy you're here. But when, when uh, uh, we messaged each other, you said that even for you, like how your, however you view religion, you know, your own religious experience and religious, religiosity, um, it is complicated. So how, how do you, how do you, how, to tell us more about that. Who, you know, who are you inside? <laughs> that's, I guess, a, yeah. a way to put it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. But um, yeah. yeah, it's it's really funny because I I still even now hesitate to say I'm religious or I don't I don't follow any one particular religion right now. Mm -hmm. um, but religion has colored my entire life and I have this very strong personal interest in it and so it's this thing where mm -hmm. I, I have another friend that i joke with this about sometimes because um he's he's an atheist and i like to prod him because he's you know he's an atheist but he has this strange fascination with like all things spiritual um and i feel like that was mm -hmm. me for a long time um i can share a little bit about i guess like my my background or relationship to religion. i, I would love to i would love to hear that but one, <laughs> one question about your friend is it is it a academic fascination or no. I think it's more than that. I think it's yeah, I guess because yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, and I think it's like similar to like I think he and I are maybe like two sides of the same coin, and I just decided to flip the bit just like a little bit over yeah. the other way. Um, but that same sort of hmm, if I'm not, you know, I'm not really religious, but like I'm also seem to be, and it's just you know dancing around the, the edge of the coin a lot. 
Uh, I think any any atheist would uh, admit that religion exists, and and, yeah. and once it exists, I mean it influences uh, human societies heavily. So I can see how anybody would take an in, like an academic interest in like I want to understand this phenomena, right? Yeah, but that, for you, a lot of people, it's more than that. I think if you take an interest in people, and yeah, if you're sort of you know interested in creative spirit of and what moves people, then you kind of end up inevitably falling into religion one way or the other or having to grapple with it. Um, that's kind of how I think I fell into it. Um, but tell me, tell us more about yourself. So how, how is that for you? Yeah. So um, I was born Christian, I guess. Uh, my mom, I always say my mom is like Catholic Buddhist. I don't really know if that's a thing, but um, she's from Indonesia. So she, uh, she's from this like very small minority that is Catholic and Christian. Um, most, most Indonesians are, are Muslim. Um, and so, you know, had, had some of that, but then she also has these sort of like Buddhist tendencies cause she's, um, Chinese Indonesian. And so we always had just this mix of some, you know, I, I learned the Lord's prayer. I, I prayed when I was a kid. And then I also, we would do, you know, um, we would do all these sort of Chinese traditions around burning like incense sticks and stuff and praying to, you know, um, ancestors mm -hmm. who have who what passed was away. that was that in the u.s was that in the um, US? yeah that was in the u.s i grew up i grew up in the u.s my um i actually grew up between okay. the u.s and indonesia um okay uh it's because my mom lived, lived there so um so i was always around some weird mix of different religions and then when you know i would spend my summers in indonesia it's a muslim country so you know we'd wake up hearing the call to prayer in the mornings and stuff so um just immersed in like a lot of different traditions i think mm -hmm. um and then i went to a quaker high school um, and by then I think I'd considered myself atheist. I think atheism was very like in vogue also, maybe around that time, there was this whole wave of atheism. So it was like- When, when was that? Yeah. That was, was uh, 2000s, I guess, 20, yeah. Abs yeah. Absolutely. They were, you're gonna go, yeah. I, I, I don't wanna say that this is the reason a lot of people, and I, was, I don't even wanna say that this is the reason for me, but I would be lying if I don't, wouldn't you know, display the, this, play the part because this is what the you know the beautiful people around you are doing <laughs> is that during the time when you also became yeah, atheist yeah. uh it was a little bit earlier than that uh i think i was i was 14 i was born in 82 uh and i it was between 14 and 15, and 15 that i really said no now i'm an atheist however I didn't drop straight into that and we're gonna i, I want to connect those dots later uh because yeah. i would in it, for my first year, I was like, okay, I'm an atheist. But then I went into New Age due to some experiences yeah. that I had. And again, New Age is a, is a collective term because I experimented with a bunch of stuff. And, and then after a couple more years, I say, oh, you know what? That, that, that's all nonsense. So let, let's, let me go back to you. Uh, so <laughs> okay, it, we can it will talk be, about that too. <laughs> yeah, it will, be around, it will be around that time where I had my final, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done with all of that. I do wonder if all of this is just a rite of passage somehow sometimes because it is you know I think I have maybe a very similar trajectory but it's there's something when you're a teenager you're experimenting you're questioning like you know what are the things I was raised with are they real or not yeah. and that's part of like finding your identity and forming it right um, so I think mm -hmm. that was maybe around the same time where I was just sort of I don't remember there was an exact moment because we weren't you know strongly religious but I was raised Christian uh, but at some point it was kind of it just sort of fell away and it's like Mm -hmm. you know smart educated people are atheists like we don't we don't fall for any there of that stuff you know like that there that was go. the thing <laughs> we're, we're um, better than that yeah we're better than that like you know, <laughs> i don't need this stuff and i still hear you know i, I think I, i've noticed at least maybe among like my my peer circles in tech there is a little bit more of this openness to to religion now which we can talk about mm -hmm. later but um but for a while that, that really felt like that was the line, even as an adult where it's like you know smart people don't fall for religion um and so, but, but I went to a Quaker high school and so it, Quakers are really, I don't know if you have any familiarity with um, Quakers, but uh, they're sort of, they're, they're kind of like, well, there's a lot of different, I guess, different Quaker traditions around the world, but um, in Pennsylvania where I grew up, it's, um, they're very much like, I always think of them as like hippie Christians or something. Cause it's uh, the, the religious services are very um, egalitarian. I don't really know how to describe. So you're basically like everyone is sitting in a room in silence for an hour um, and you only stand up and you speak when you're moved by the light of God or that of God within you to say something. Um, and so, you know, everyone's just sitting there basically meditating for an hour. And then when you feel moved by God, you stand up, you can say, reflect on anything you're thinking about, you sit back down and there's no formal services or anything. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I really enjoyed my Quaker education because I think it, 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 there's something that they're 
they're trying to convey, which is like, you know, that of God and everyone. So everyone you see is, there's no one is better or worse than anyone. You know, all our teachers, we call it by our first names. Everyone would like sit in circles for their class. It's the idea mm -hmm. that, you know, everyone has something to teach you. You have something to share with everyone. So I thought that was a really good foundation. Um, but yeah, I mean, always just sort of like toying with religion or had some sort of philosophical interest in it, I think, and just maybe trying to grapple with the logic of it. And that was the part that would always kind of trip me up. And eventually I realized that's, you know, the, the whole point of, of God is that it can't, you can't work your way into God with logic. Um, and then that, then it all made sense to me, but, um, but yeah, I think do, I was just Do, do you think that, uh, just uh, if I want to explore yeah. that a little bit, what, what is, what is it for you? Is it that you, you cannot get there with logic or do you expect things about God to be illogical or like a, you know, once you have a couple, certain couple of assumptions, then things make sense. Uh, Cause that's, that's how yeah. I view this today. Like I think, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm not here to tell my story, but like I came to religion later completely through rational means. Like, oh, really? like C.S. Lewis, like Lewis, for example, yeah. it's famously a person who would just argue his way in, into that. Uh, but, you know, I, I do say that like for the concept of God, you do have to make a couple of axiomatic assumptions. But once those assumptions are in place, I think everything that follows is fairly logical. Uh, and you, would you yeah. agree with that? Or? Yeah, I think maybe we're saying the same thing then. Because, yeah, okay. yeah, C.S. Lewis was definitely really, really important for you to, um, because mm -hmm. he's just thinking out loud and he's not trying to tell you what to do. He's just sharing his own yeah. experience. Um, and, yeah, I think for, it's like, I feel like I can reason and logic my way all the way up to the very, very last step. And then the very last mm -hmm. step, you kind of just got to take the leap of faith. And then, then everything makes sense again in, in a logical sort of way. So for me, like the way I define God is 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 just like that, which can't be defined. Um, and mm -hmm. for a long time, I think until very recently, um, I thought of. I, I always had the vague sense that yeah, God God is everything that you have to kind of take a leap of faith on, or um, everything that just can't be explained, and um, and acknowledging that there even is something in the world that you know that can't be explained then like that that is god but i think for a while i thought of god as like an entity or you know god is this void or lump or thing over there that like i don't understand and it almost gave me this sense of like i'm looking for god around the corner or something um yeah. you know wh where is god he can't be defined uh and at some point more recently i think what i've come to realize is god is this more like pervasive concept of like there everything we do is a backdrop um, against God, which can't be defined, if that makes sense. Um, I haven't really tried to articulate this out loud before, um, but... Uh, well, you did, yeah. you did great. You, you yeah. did great, actually, because, uh, um, and and again, uh, I'm not a spokesperson for anything, uh, but, but uh, so I'm always careful when, when I make statements like that, but I think this is actually pretty close to the academic Christian vision. Which is yeah, not the so. same as the as, as your you know, next door neighbor's Christ vision of Christianity, and and I always try to make this distinction. But for example, one of the things that atheists would say, and myself back then, is is this idea of like, oh, I just don't believe in one less God than you. Uh, then you know because you don't you also don't believe in Thor, you don't believe in in Zeus, you don't you don't. But one of the things that I came to realize later is that all of those beings are this that you describe that you don't view God as, right? They're a yeah. entity, right? There's a, a, this entity called Thor that you can go and say, look, uh, is this real or not? Is Freya real or not? Or is uh, Athena real or not? But the God of the Bible, uh, at least, uh, doesn't seem to be like that. It has a personality and it has a will, but it's also not a being in that sense, right? Yeah, like I think anything we can do to describe what god is even the word god or any concept of god like all of it is not actually god it's just the layer of interpretation that we yeah. put on top of it um and again like i felt like i could understand this in theory for a long time but like until you're really faced or like hit with something that is undefinable then then you realize like oh there are actually things that i cannot experience or i cannot access and like that is what god is mm. um yeah, but it took. It's funny now because it seems so obvious, but it took me a really long time yeah. to get there. And you seem to be talking from experience. Yeah. When you say until yeah. you come face to face, so. 
Yeah, I hadn't. Well, so this gets me into more like uh, weird hippie territory, um, <laughs> or I'm being self-deprecating about it. But um, yeah. but I recently this year I kind of stumbled into um, this meditation practice that I was actually just writing about, and from this like anthropological perspective, because there's this subculture of people on Twitter that are practicing this thing called the jhanas. Um, mm-hmm. that are this, um, there are a series of these like altered mentor- mental states that you can get to through concentration alone. And they're supposed to be, you know, very intensely altered mental states. Um, so, uh, and I was, you know, writing about, writing about these other people that are doing this thing, you know, and, uh, and one of the people I interviewed, um, invited me to go on a retreat to just try it myself. And I'm not a meditator. I didn't, you know, I, I, I I, I figured I would just try it for the sake of trying it and understanding mm-hmm. what was going on. Um, and I went through it and I, and was just sort of like mind blown by the whole experience. Um, and now I've been trying to understand like, what, what is this thing that <laughs> our mm-hmm. brains can do that I didn't realize they could do. So that's kind of the backstory to it. But, um, but recently as I was, you know, trying to, to go through these experiences, um, the, there's basically, there's like eight different states and you start in this, um, accessing this feeling of intense euphoria and the euphoria kind of dissolves into, uh, uh, I guess, equanimity or um, sort of a more dissociated sensation. And the final experience is that you, uh, are, your consciousness just sort of switches off. Um, uh, and so I went through all, all these states and got to the point where your consciousness switches off. And, um, and the experience is actually just like, you're just blinking out. Like you're just, it's like when you go under general anesthesia and mm-hmm. you know, you wake up and suddenly time has passed and you didn't even realize it. Um, sorry, sorry if it feels like it is completely stupid question, but how do you know you're just not sleeping? If that's how you <laughs> described it, right? Just that. I actually, the first, the first yeah. time or maybe the first two times I was like, did I just fall asleep? And then I, I tried it uh, again, or I, you know, I was doing a couple different sessions and then like, um, and then I did, I had a a time when I actually did fall asleep and then I was like, okay, these two things are really qualitatively different. Um, I think the difference is that you're very alert going into it and you're very alert coming out of it. So you don't feel this drowsiness of drifting off. You don't feel sleepy. Um, you're just like, um, it's as if I were sitting here awake right now and then suddenly like time passed. Yeah. Um, I, I I was gonna say that maybe I was just a better meditator than I thought because I tried <laughs> meditation a bunch of times, including mm-hmm. my new age phase, and I always end up falling asleep. Uh, but it is really from what you describe, you're really falling asleep because you I'm yeah. feeling like drowsy. Uh, just there's no. Sometimes I do going. just yeah. fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And the experience itself is just sort of um, it's a little bit absurd. Basically, like my first reaction to it was. Oh, wow. I spent, you know, all these months trying to, you're, you're told that this is like the final or the last day. And so your brain is sort of like striving to get to this last day, or at least mine was not everyone's is, but my, I, I was like, okay, I want to, I want to get all the way to the end. I want to experience this thing. And then you actually experience the thing and you, you, you literally can't experience it. And so something about it just felt very absurd to me that, oh, the self, the, the version of myself that is consciously striving towards um, attaining this state is, like literally can't even experience the state itself. I can only know that I experienced it after the fact. Um, In- interesting, and, interesting. Yeah, it's, and so it's, at first it's I very thought, dissociative, right? It's like you're talking about someone else. Yeah, yeah, it, but, but but and and I think that that's the 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 flip is, and you realize, oh, there's some, yeah, there, there's some there's something that some experience that can happen in the world that I actually can't, I can never actually consciously experience um and so you know therefore there are things in the world that are completely undefinable and i think and i recognize like you know it's really hard to explain a thing um it just sounds like gibberish probably uh from the outside but um but there was something about that experience where it it finally hit me that like oh you know everything i can conceive of in this world all exists as uh in the shadow of or in the light of like some, some other pervasive thing that is undefinable. Um, and so now I understand what it means that, you know, everything is made in the image of God or in the light of God, because God is this yeah pervasive undefined and everything else is defined. Um, and be- before our conversation, I was going back and reading one of, uh, an essay I wrote in September about, uh, C.S. Lewis's surprised by joy, oh. which is, yeah, his, his memoir about, yes. um, 
going from being uh, religious as a child to atheist to then rediscovering his religion. Um, I was just rereading to kind of like jog my own memory about what I wrote about in the fall. Um, and it was funny to reread that now because at that time I hadn't done any of this meditation stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just sort of writing about the experience and trying to make sense of it for, for myself. Um, and I realized like, oh, it's actually, now it, it took on a completely different meaning for me where I actually like understand what he's he's talking yeah. about. So, um, cause his-, his So his were, journey was, were you, what, what, did you, you're saying like, you weren't an atheist as well, which I did not know. It's just, uh, so we, we connect here. Is this the yeah. thing that took you out of this or, or it was just unrelated? Um, it's just a- I would say I was already not, Yes, for a while now, but I just okay. didn't know what to call it. So okay. I, I think like I would always say I'm, and you know, people will say sometimes like, oh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And I never loved that framing because it felt like you're not committing to being religious <laughs> or something. Yeah. Um, and so I would just say I'm religious, but I don't follow any particular religion. But like, do I believe in God? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I'd they invest, they, I years. think the investment community would call this preserving optionality, right? Because yes. you're not religious, <laughs> but you're also not, you're, you're not I'm, I'm just preserving yeah. optionality. So Which I think like is, <laughs> and I think a huge part yeah. of it is just like, you just got to like commit, you know, you just got to stay. Yeah. And, and I think that's like being challenged on that is what has pushed me further along because it's too easy to say, oh, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I'm just not going to think about it. It's like, okay, but what does it look like if you do confront it and you do force yourself to think about mm -hmm. it? Um, you might, you know, force yourself to make a decision one way or the other. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say that I believed in God for many years already leading up to my more recent experiences, but I just didn't, the only thing I could say was like, you know, God is something that requires a leap of faith to understand. God is the thing that is undefined or, you know, the thing that you can never actually sink your teeth into or understand. Um, but then I felt like, oh, now I've actually understand it. Um, and so the, the C.S. Lewis um, trajectory or, or his, his path to conversion made sense to me in theory when I read it, but I couldn't understand it until I then experienced it myself a few months later. Mm -hmm. um, so his the, the memoir, Surprised by Joy, is about him seeking this feeling of joy, which is like, you know, this like intense euphoria that you get when you're just really in the zone. You're really just like fully energized by something i um, i would love to i would love to feel that i i, I see people describing this and I'll, I'll be quite transparent and honest and pour my heart out which is something i love to do uh the other day i caught me thinking i wanted to die not in a suicidal manner uh because i'm not suicidal or anything like that but i was uh watching people describing ndes uh, if mm, you read near death experiences, and, and, yeah. and, and he is war one of the things like i had many things that kind of started flipping me over uh, over the like they described this intense feeling of joy like nothing you've ever felt on on this planet i'm not, I'm not really a very experientialist person like i'm a very rational mm -hmm. person and i'm not saying this to boast i actually would prefer not to be that way <laughs> right <laughs> But 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 this is who I am, and and like a, a part of me feels envious about you know those people die, and and is this the only time in my life I will ever be able to feel like this intense feeling of joy that people describe? Because mm -hmm. I just don't feel that. I just uh, right? that's what I've been learning since uh, yeah exploring these sort of altered states that um, some people have trouble tapping into a feeling of life is pleasant, but yeah. life is not. They don't have that intense euphoria. Exactly. Yeah. Which, yeah, I learned, I think, comes very easily to me. And I didn't I didn't quite realize that myself until realizing that it doesn't come easily to other people. Um, but I think like the plot twist of C.S. Lewis's journey was that for a long time, he thought that was God. And that's how I felt, too, where I was like, for me, like that feeling of intense euphoria or just being dialed in or zoned in, like comes comes to me a lot when I'm doing creative works, if I'm writing or I'm just, you know, really, really focused on a task at hand. Like it just feels really good to be. I, I get this, yeah, this really intense feeling. And, and for a long time, I thought, oh, that that is what it means to be close to God, because you're just sort of, you're you're so charged in this particular way. Um, and, you know, creative work is is how you, it is divine. It's like how you get close to God. Um, and so he takes you through his whole memoir with this sort of assumption that like, oh, yes, joy, joy is divine. And then he gets to the end and he's like, at some point he realizes, oh, joy is just the signpost. Joy is... Um, Okay. What what are you even trying to seek in trying to you know get feel this intense joy? Um, what what is the end point there? Uh, and once he realized that 
there is no real like the, the end point is something he can't even understand. He was getting so caught up in like the feeling of joy and the seeking of joy. Uh, and then he was like, oh, that's what God is. God is that thing that at the end that like I can never actually define or touch or understand. And once he understood that, that, that was his conversion point. Um, and then he was, and then he he ends the whole, the whole memoir in which he's talking about joy the whole time. He ends up being like, I don't really think about joy that much anymore. And I read it at the time and I was just kind of like, how, how did that happen? <laughs> because I still felt very governed by this, you know, the joy seeking thing. Um, and so I know it's interesting to reread it now because uh, now it makes perfect sense to me where I, yeah, I don't really think about joy anymore because you understand there's something beyond that. that beyond is just joy, like, yeah. It's yeah. just undefinable. Um, and yeah, and Feels everything like, else that you're like doing. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That that is that is awesome. But like, uh, what took you to the point in 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 which you in, in in summary? Because I mean, I think that the meditation story is the most interesting part here. But how did you become a non atheist? It's just what was the thing that changed the most to, to get you into that journey? I don't know that I had one specific yeah. point. If I do, I don't remember. I think it was just an emergent thing. From I think it was that pursuit of joy. Maybe as the initial flip of um yeah of, of realizing that oh i feel you know as your sort of like career develops and you start having your own identity around the kind of work you like to do and stuff um i realized like oh i like the kind of work i love to do is just chasing that something that chasing that unknown and to me that felt like a pursuit of the pursuit of the divine or a pursuit of like something that i can't really understand and i don't know what is motivating me so strongly to want to do these things but it can only be a divine sort of like push. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was maybe what, at some point it just became this emergent realization of, well, if there's something that I can't define, then maybe that is the divine thing. Um, yeah, there's something about, I guess, faith. I do think about there's this, <laughs> I, went, I went to a wedding, um, probably like, this is at least a decade ago. Um, and the the father of the bride had this really cool magic trick that he did. So he does magic tricks. Um, it was definitely one of the coolest coolest toasts I'd seen at a wedding. Um, and so he he basically had them do the you know pick a card trick, um, and he goes through the whole you know all the all the fancy stuff that comes with that. And then at the end, he takes out this box that he I think he had made the box himself. Um, it was a locked box that couldn't be opened and uh, he says okay your card is inside the box and um you if you want you could unlock the box and find that it's there or you could just take it on faith that i know what your card is and your card is inside this box and he said something like you know if you ever find yourself needing a source of faith in your a moment of faith or your faith is being challenged in your marriage you could unlock the box and see what the card is inside um, but otherwise, you know, the whole point is that you don't know what's inside the box. You're just going to have to trust me. Um, and there's something about that. It's it's a funny story account because it's not like I I don't I'm, I, I was there as a plus one. I'm not. <laughs> it's not even. <laughs> there are not even people that I know in my life now. Um, but something about that magic trick kind of stuck with me. Whereas it was just a very tangible example of what faith is, where it's like you literally just don't know and you can't know, and you kind of have to be okay with that. And I think the older you get, the more you realize there are, I think, especially like having, having a kid now too, you just, you realize there are some things you just can't explain and um, some things you can't control and you just got to take them on faith. And I think that's, that's, that's probably why a lot of people do become more religious as they get older too. You, yeah. you realize it comes with wisdom, right? It's like the older you get, the more you realize you just don't know a lot of things and you mm -hmm. will not know them and you have to accept them versus I think that teenager version where becoming an atheist know, is that yeah. moment where you're like, yeah, you're I'm like, powerful. I know everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you get older, you're like, I know nothing. Um, and yeah. that's actually quite comforting. Yes. Uh, we have one of our regulars today here. Hey, Dev. Uh, Dev, in fact, it is, that is his name. I thought uh, he is a developer. So he started calling himself Dev. But in fact, that's his name. Uh, and yeah. Dev, thank you so much for being here as usual. But Dev has a comment here that God is everything that cannot be explained. It actually makes perfect sense. But he he says that this is the God of the gaps thing. And I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, how do you view that? The God of the... Have, are you familiar with this concept that the atheist... I mean, I, I was. That was one of my favorite arguments back then. I uh, think popularized by Richard Dawkins. Mm. That there's the God of the gaps. 
So uh, everything that you don't understand, you say it's God. So like, why does that thunder comes? Oh, it's God. God made made that happen. And what this other thing here? Oh, it was God. But as science progresses, you know more and more and more and more. So God starts hiding in the gaps, and and right, just mm. there is less and less of a place for God because as your knowledge expands, you're just pushing God away to those gaps of knowledge. But one day we're going to get there too. So that's essentially the God of the gaps uh, mm. argument, which again I think is I used to regurgitating to everybody uh, <laughs> today i think it's complete nonsense but um how do you view yeah that? i i haven't i guess i haven't thought about it before so i don't know what all the uh yeah. official counter arguments are on this thing um but my first reaction to it would be you know are just based on how you've explained it like is there a point where we're actually going to know everything or is it just asymptotic or you know it's not we're always going to approach but there's always going to be that little bit that you don't know or that you can't experience um i don't I think that that is the the divide that I feel or I see sometimes with like friends in tech, especially who are um, not religious or don't think very much about faith in their life, where there's some assumption that everything is knowable at some point. And mm -hmm. I just like, I just don't think that's true. And I, I think maybe like some of the examples, like the examples you mentioned of, oh, you know, why do we have thunder? It's because, you know, God, uh, God made it happen. Like those are... Yeah, maybe those are like knowable facts <laughs> um and mm -hmm. maybe there is a world in which we get to learn all the knowable facts which seems crazy to me but you know maybe um but when i say that god is undefined or everything we can i don't really mean things that can be gleaned as facts i think it's more mm -hmm. you know like the the experience i had where you know your consciousness shuts off and it's like no matter what like i i cannot experience like you you logically cannot experience an unconscious experience like it's it's not possible yeah. um and, and it's funny because like one of the things and this is a conclusion that i i reached recently uh, i i think i had this feeling for a long 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 time but only recently i could like put into words a lot of people talk about the beginning of the universe and you know the the physical laws and etc that br brought things into existence so you don't need God to explain any of that because like I have those mathematical laws and that explains the behavior of pretty much everything in the universe. So there you go, touche. But one, one of the things that I came to realize is that it is not obvious to me that immaterial things like math and logic are not themselves created. Like if you think about nothingness, like it's not obvious to me that math is there in that nothingness already. Uh, so there has to be something that predates even logic, like even the logical things we can talk about, even the categories that we can create. Uh, again, e e even yeah. even the relationship between things, even the concept of a contradiction, even the concept of an identity, like I think that itself is a created thing. So there, there has to be something before any of that, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think math is a good place to find actually that... The proofs of God, not, not the other way around, um, in, in the undefined. And so, I mean, I find it in, it, when I'm trying to understand people or how they work or relationships and stuff, like, I think that's another place where it's just hard for me to imagine that you will ever know, you know, why, why does my mother love me? Or like, why do I love my son? Like, well, I, 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 I keep asking myself why I love my daughters because yeah. at times I think, look, I, I kind of don't right now. <laughs> when they're finger-painting the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you do, you know, and you just, you know yeah. that you do and it doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. And you can come up with all these sort of like, you know, biological explanations or the Evo psych explanations, but they, they just feel so anemic in comparison to like what you know in your heart. And uh, I think people are complex and multivariate and, uh, you know, we barely understand our own brains. Um, it, it just, I don't see a world in which we'll ever be able to perfectly map every single, like, every, every single possible variable to be able to predictably say, like, why it is that, you know, you feel love for someone. It's just, um, I don't know. Yeah. That's, uh, that's super good. But look, I, I, I'll share an experience with you that I had, and I would love for you to comment on that because uh, you, you come from this. Uh, I, I want to talk more about your meditation experience as well. When when I abandoned religion the first time uh, and said, look, I'm an atheist now, 
I'm, I am 15. I know everything there is to know. I'm the smartest guy in the world. So th th there you go. I, I adopted a very materialistic worldview, right? And everything is scientific. Everything is, is uh, explainable. Uh, everything is physical. But I had a really crazy experience that that is what put me in the new age path, uh, by and large, in which I went to a party once. And again, I, I think I was 16 or 17 when I was in that party. And I, everybody, everybody was drunk, uh, which I shouldn't be, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> and, and I had this friend and I had this friend that uh, said that he was learning hypnosis and he could, uh, he could connect you with your past lives. And then he could essentially could get you to talk about your past lives and etc. And I thought it was all nonsense. And the thing about past lives, I still do. But he was, I, I was, I passed out and, and I woke up. And when I woke up, uh, he, he was hypnotizing a friend of ours, like a friend in common. And, and this guy was like talking all sorts of things. And, and he was saying like, uh, oh, you know, where are you now? Oh, I'm in this metal and I, I see the army coming. Because in, in past lives, nobody was a carpenter. Like everybody was a general of an army and, and things like that. <laughs> and, 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 and then I was like, yeah, well, exactly. But that, that, that's, that's my point. Okay. And just, um, yeah. which is why I picked this, this exact analogy. But everybody that get, gets hypnotized about past lives, I mean, they're all powerful figures, yes but, very important <laughs> uh, so i said okay like uh, this is nonsense and this is complete bs uh and if if it's not nonsense do it with me i bet you can't because it, it's so i was like challenging this person and look i will never forget this experience i will never ever ever forget this experience i was laying down on the floor and he started doing the process like of hypnosis so, so put yourself in a comfortable position and, and he said he, he said i'm going to count down from 10 to one, and then you're going to stop feeling your, your feet. And up until five, I was like, ha ha, what a clown. Like, a, and, but, but when you got to four, I stopped feeling my feet. Uh, and then I thought, well, lucky coincidence. And then he, he moved to my knees, uh, same thing. And after uh, around four, I stopped feeling my knees at some point I couldn't feel my legs. And then what happened is that I started like. I, I went. I went into this experience from a position of like I just don't believe it, uh, but you know it's all fake. But at some point I, I could barely move my head, and he was trying to shut me down. Uh, but I was I was fighting like I never fought anything before in my life because I'm this motherfucker is not and part of my French, but like uh, this guy is not putting me to sleep. That is not happening. So I, I thought very actively, and it in fact it didn't happen. Uh, like this last, like my, my brain didn't shut down, but because I was terrified and, and like, and I rose and say, see, it's all nonsense. But I was terrified from that moment on because like, a, I think it kind of broke my mental model and I'm not claiming, in fact, I'm claiming the opposite, the hypnosis as anything supernatural or anything like that. But that comp the fact that somebody could just keep telling me, like shut down parts of your body from a distance without even touching me. And again, it's not just suggestion because I was fighting actively to get out of that state like that messed up a little bit with my comprehension <laughs> of of uh of life <laughs> have yeah. you had an experience like that just to... um a little bit well i mean this yeah. whole yeah meditation thing this year for yeah. sure but what actually primed me for even being able to believe it was a thing um was last year when i gave birth to my son uh so you know you're talking about hypnosis a really common thing that um, women do, which I learned to prepare for childbirth is, um, hypnobirthing, which is, they, Oh, my wife, my wife tried that. Uh, yeah, great. My wife yeah. Tried that didn't work for her very much. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I, I can't, I'm yeah. not sure like really how I, I definitely didn't use it in the moment. So I guess for anyone listening, it's yeah. like, um, you're, you're, you do this self hypnosis to kind of prepare yourself for childbirth and to mentally, mentally prepare for it. And you're sort of, you know, thinking about all the peaceful thoughts and how easy it's going to be and all this stuff. Um, I think, I, I've never tried the sort of like party trick type hypnosis. Um, I've, you know, mm. whenever they do the audience and they have them do the tests and stuff, like I never pass. Yeah. So I, I've never, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be the person making a fool of myself on stage. So I never volunteer. Um, but that was, so that was the first time I tried like the self hypnosis thing. I think it kind of worked maybe in the sense of, I definitely went into some kind of trance like state. And then I know that, you know, when, when the prompt would come to, you know, wake yourself up and count yourself out, like I would wake up. Um, but it didn't feel particularly, I don't know, mind blowing. I don't know how useful it was or wasn't, but I also had a great 
a great birth experience, so maybe it worked. Um, but but the actual experience of uh, of birth was definitely like a. I mean, you know, you can't really prepare for it, right? It's like you don't really yeah. know what to expect. And um, and I decided that I wanted to do an unmedicated childbirth because I just wanted to like experience the whole thing and see, you know, what what is this thing like? And in preparation for that, learned a lot about just how like your psychology is tied to your physical body and um, a lot of you know whatever you're thinking. If you're scared, you kind of tense up. If you're relaxed, you uh, your, your your body relaxes too. Um, and just like this thing that I had assumed was so perfectly medicalized, I guess, because of that's the way that's always talked about. Um, I had not understood that there's actually like a very strong psychological component of it. And the way that you mm -hmm. think actually like manifests itself in reality, which sounds so like woo and fake if I think about it in the abstract. But then I actually like, you know, went through and experienced it. Um, and yeah, birth is definitely an altered state of consciousness. I mean, you're just on a whole other right? plane. Um, I wouldn't yeah. know. I wouldn't know. And but you were, I, yeah, yeah. You were there I don't think my wife. I don't think my wife knows either. Because uh, again, not to discourage you, but my wife had a very complicated uh, experience, and she spent 26 hours in labor. Uh, oh my and gosh! She after that, she, so she she initially tried to do the unmedicated thing. After eight hours, she was moved to the hospital, took an epidural. Uh, and then the total thing was 26 hours, uh, including the, the yeah. initial eight hours. I, ha I had to drive her to the hospital with contraction because like the, we went to a birth center and because she wanted mm -hmm. like the whole natural thing. Uh, and and they said, you know, just that if, if you have an emergency, we can take you to the hospital. But turns out pain is not an emergency. So like the, the, go to the hospital. <laughs> so I, I had to go drive her to the hospital. Oh my gosh. Luckily, there was no traffic or anything like that. But getting there, like so that, then she took the epidural 26 hours total. And then after all of that, she had to have a C-section because that guy, that guy was just not leaving. Just yeah. a, she was dilated. It was all of that. But like after after like my my boy is like a big blob of something. <laughs> after <laughs> After after they took him out, it was like yeah yeah this the, the, you would have died like so so she was one of the cases in which you truly need that. Uh, I think the part wow, that not champion. to discourage is that nothing prepares you for what comes after like uh, the, when and when he's three or four and starts like as you said painting the walls yeah. and like, that that is the part that's, that she would acknowledge is super hard. But but it's funny that you say like that like it's a mental state and and we lost we lost touch with a lot of our inner self in in modern society didn't we i was i was the other days you just talk about childbirth i mean most women will go to hospital as a first choice yeah and the other the other day i saw someone talking about like how ancient people look you you went up you went up at night and you saw the sky and this is one of the things that will like if, if you don't see god here like a get your head checked that that's his argument not mine but like a you don't see, you don't even have this experience today of walking out you have to seek that experience very, very deliberately, but you don't have the experience of going out and seeing the Milky Way. Have you ever yeah. saw the Milky Way? I saw it once, but uh, you have to really go and seek it. Yeah, you have to see. It's true. I mean, I, I don't. I think I'm lucky in that my day to day, I get to be very focused, very, I have a pretty mm -hmm. distraction free, like just because of the type of work that I do. Um, I'm sure like a lot of developers have this experience too. If you get to be very heads down and meeting free, meetings free, then, you know, you, you get to be in this very like in, in touch with what you're doing kind of mode. Um, but I think that's rare and it's, you know, not realistic for a lot of, uh, for a lot of people. And I, I think you're just like constantly jumping around from one thing to another and you kind of forget like, what is your attention actually capable of? And what do you notice when you can actually be still and silent? Um, yeah, it's a, I had a, a friend who ran like a Twitter poll at some point that was like, you know, how long can you can you sit for, I don't remember what the interval was. I think it was like five minutes. Can you sit for like five minutes by yourself not doing anything? And I was shocked that like a majority of people said they couldn't. And I, I just like- No, I can't, didn't, I can't, and I like, absolutely can't. Yeah, which is like wild to me because it's like you, you learn so much in that stillness of just like sitting there and like not not thinking so much. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I wish I don't know. I don't even know how to prioritize that for people because I think if you don't do it, then you don't realize what you're missing. Or you don't see it, um, mm -hmm. and I don't. You can't like force someone to do it. But um, and you know, life realistically is challenging and busy and chaotic, so it's hard to find those moments. But. Um. You were talking. Tell us more about the genres. Because again, after I got to know you, I was reading some of your writings uh, and, and 
it seems like a, what is the difference between that and just normal, what people will call meditation? Yeah. So um, my understanding, and I'm going to be talking a little bit as a noob here, because I kind of came into it very cold with no, uh, yeah, no, no real background meditation. So um, this is sort mm -hmm. of my, my understanding of it. I might be wrong on some things, but um, it seems they're kind of like these two types, two broad categories of meditation. One is, um, I'll call it like maybe like awareness focused or broadening, broaden insight meditation, maybe um, where you're, you're trying to like broaden your your awareness of your surroundings and, and notice everything around you. And that's that's the sort of like mindfulness meditation that's taught in the West. Um, Vipassana meditation is, is I think, this sort of tradition where you're um, they're I guess they're, they're trying to get you not to, to run away with your brain. And, and the technique for doing that is just to sort of like notice everything in your present moment. Um, so it's an expanding of awareness. The other type of meditation, which has is not traditionally been part of like Western um, meditation schools, is concentration type meditation, and that's that's what the jhanas falls into. So instead of being very like aware of everything that's going on, you're kind of like dialing in and zeroing in on something. Um, and so I liken this to to flow state versus relaxation, where yeah. if you're relaxed, you're kind of just you know you're not thinking about a whole lot, you're just at ease. Um, but if you're in flow state, you're in like like dialed into a moment just like oh. really really focus on one task you yeah. can do that task i mean i can if i'm really zoned in i can go for like you know 12 hours and just not even think and just and, and then at the end feel refreshed right um mm -hmm. and so you're 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 tapping into into that sort of mindset where you're just focusing on a thing and then where the jhanas part comes in is you're you're taking that attention that focus that flow state mindset and you're directing it towards a positive emotion. So um, they're often described as the opposite of a panic attack, where you, any of us could induce a panic attack if we went to right now, probably. If you're you know, thinking about something that makes you anxious and you start fixating on the anxiety and it, you're letting it grow and escalate, and suddenly you're just sort of like mm. freaking out for you know no reason. Um, jhanas are that, but you take a positive emotion and you fixate on the positive emotion and you kind of let that loop and loop and escalate. And then you, instead of being in a panic attack, you end up in this like intensely euphoric state. Um, and then if you continue to sit with that, you continue to fixate, let it deepen and grow. Your brain starts doing all sorts of <laughs> weird stuff where you go from the euphoric state, the euphoria kind of burns off. You end up in a state of like peacefulness. Um, it's not that different mm -hmm. from anything you can think of. of so, you know, compared to like, um, when you start dating someone, you have the initial sort of like buzzy honeymoon phase, then it kind of, you know, evens out, you're just sort of like joyful, happy to be with them. At some point, it kind of stabilizes into this feeling of commitment or solidarity and partnership. Um, it's it's the same progression, but you're just doing it, I guess, faster and without any sort of external stimulation. Do you um, do you do you always focus on a positive thing? Uh, or just not a panic? Because for example, you could you let, let's uh, and maybe later I'll draw the connection there where I'm trying to get with that. What about sorrow? Can Can you do this? Focusing on sorrow because sorrow, Probably. sorrow is it's in, yeah because sorrow yeah. is not a panic, right? Right. I kind of wonder about. So I was thinking it would be interesting to. Um, I I think you can just loop any emotion, right? But I I have I, I part of me as a guinea pig wants to be like, what would it happen if I tried to loop? What would happen? Yeah. Yeah. But it would probably be really sad. So <laughs> I I haven't yeah. tried it. Um, but yeah, I think theoretically you probably you probably could amplify anything, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you made the statement that uh, you don't need prior experience with meditation to do this, to do this yeah. well, because you don't need prior yeah. experience with anything to do any other thing with that, to do this well. I think it is a skill and there's some skill involved, but this, it, the reason I wanted to make that distinction is because people talk about jhanas as a type of advanced meditation. Um, and there's some implication that, uh, you know, only an experienced meditator would do this. So the analogy I use is like, if you're uh, if you're if you've never gone hiking before and you're trying to go you know on Mount, to Mount Everest or something, it's just like most people would say you don't have the skills to do that. And similar with jhanas, mm -hmm. it's like oh you could you know use headspace or calm and do some mindfulness stuff. But jhanas, that's like a that's a whole other endeavor. So there's always some implication that you have to be very advanced or very experienced of a meditator to do that. Um, but you know I came into it without any meditation background at all. I'd, I'd gone on one. Zen retreat with a friend for fun a decade ago, but otherwise I don't meditate at all. I still don't like meditation. I don't and think that, doesn't, as that doesn't seem to be a correlation based on what I've saw. Yeah, I basically so I I worked with the retreat company that taught me the jhanas, and um and we 
looked at this anonymized sample of, of meditators and found that there's no correlation between meditation experience and, and uh, ability to get into it. So, and I, I, I ended up like writing out my own very like pragmatic, straightforward instructions and publishing them online. And a bunch of people have messaged me and reached out and said they tried it and it worked for them in like an hour. Um, so I, I think- and, and the I will, reason I will try. Why, Yeah, you should. I mean, so you're talking about wanting to have like near-death experiences or something to yeah. tap into that feeling of intensity. Like, you know, there's a way to do it. Um, I just like, I think part of why I want to, that distinction is important to me is that um, I just like, I feel like if it's something that, our bodies can innately do it's like you know sneezing or coughing or sleeping or whatever if it's something mm -hmm. that we are all equipped to to be able to tap into i don't like this implication that oh only certain people who are you know specially anointed can Special, do a thing yeah. that is like just part of who you who you are and so that that's i i don't do it to be like combative about you know uh you know wanting to create some sort of like um Whatever. I'm not like anti-meditation. It's just that like, if it's mm -hmm. something that is innately part of my body and predates Buddhism, like why, why is it so tied to like Buddhist tradition? Why isn't it just something that I, I can learn how to do about myself and learn, learn more about my own, my own body. Um, and I also think there's, and this is relevant to just how we've been talking about God this whole time too. Um, I think we talk too much about when you discover a form of wisdom, the the first impulse is to want to share it with everyone. And this is any sort of mm -hmm, wisdom, yes. so you're, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you want to tell everyone the thing that you learned, but it kind of just falls against deaf ears unless someone has actually experienced it themselves. So you can't tell someone what it feels like to to love someone so deeply unless they've also loved or, you know, what it feels like to, to get fired from your first job, you know, like all these, you kind of just have to go through the thing. Um, and I feel that way about faith and religion too where um i have a lot of deep thoughts on god and what god is or what god it, it feels like to me but i at least for me personally like i don't find it that useful to tell other people what i feel because that's my experience of it and i had to like mm -hmm. earn or like learn that myself through my own experiences that then like what i was talking about with c.s lewis like reading about c.s lewis's experience was interesting to me intellectually but i couldn't understand it until I then just had my own separate experience entirely. Um, and so I would love like, you know, when I think about helping other people understand religion or, um, or experience it or just engage with it, like, I, I, I feel like we should encourage people to just help create these more maybe deterministic paths for people to discover it for themselves, um, to go learn about themselves. And I really appreciate that from friends of mine who are Christian or religious that, um, they don't tell me what to believe, but they just ask questions. And then sometimes I find I can't answer the questions and I have to like, think about it. Um, I, when I read what you wrote, I, I did not try, <laughs> but the reason, <laughs> but the reason, but the reason I did not try again, being quite honest is that it just feels to me like I, I probably can't, uh, have you met people like this before? Because like my attention Many. span, my, my attention span is horrible. Like, I, I think the biggest problem I have in my life today is this Twitter thing, right? That um, we're always scrolling and, and there, there's that, like I've, rationally, I know all of that, but I have no idea how to fix it. And, and then like uh, what I keep thinking is, okay, uh, I do not, that seems to be the thing that correlates well. So I absolutely do not mm -hmm. have a great attention span. Like the life that I live today is is notifications all the time. And and, mm -hmm. and I don't code anymore very much. Uh, so so it's a, I just feel like, yeah, I mean, if I, if I would do this, it just wouldn't work because I don't have the attention span and I don't have the, 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 the feeling of joy to begin with, to serve as a basis yeah. uh, to that, which is why I was asking about sorrow. Can I, can I do this? Just yeah. <laughs> do your own version of the genre. Yeah. Do you, when you think about, you know, your, your, you recognize that your attention span is, is, is not good. Um, do you have like a desire to change it or are you sort of like, this is the way it is. And I just have to be that way because of my lifestyle. Yeah. Funny, funny question, because like desire can be interpreted in many ways. Like would I like to change it? Yes. Like, a, but you could argue that if I'm not doing everything in my power to change it, do I really want it? Right. But, the, but I think part of that is just the lifestyle that I leave. Uh, I, and it, it yeah, I, I don't know. Like I found success in, in doing what I do the way I do it. So a part of me will always come and say, yeah, but then you've stopped doing it. Like, uh, 
there will be somebody complaining about your service online and you will not see it immediately and you're not, you're not going to respond immediately and then you're not going to, like your company is not going to go as well as, as it could be. So there is always this loop about like, do I really let go? And I think that is what I haven't done yet. Yeah. Yeah. That fear is very real. Especially when your life is sort of built around a certain way of being. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, this is a, I mean, I have a completely different lifestyle day to day, but I, I had this fear when I, when I wrote that piece about um, C.S. Lewis's journey um, last fall, part of why I was writing it was because I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, whether intentionally or not, I feel like I've built my entire life around writing. Writing always comes up in the work that I do, mm -hmm. my interest in every shape and form. Um, and that's, you know, also any success or satisfaction I've had with work has come through this skill of writing and this desire to write. Um, at the same time, I feel that I, I had maybe like a, a sort of unhealthy relationship with writing where it just felt like this, mm -hmm. this reflexive urge or addiction that I just, I like always needed to kind of get things out and this, your, your brain is just ruminating in like a loop, you know, and then you just put it on the paper and then you send it out. And that's what writing is. Um, and I'd convinced myself that this was, you know, pursuit of the divine, but then I read C.S. Lewis's piece and I was like, oh no, it's not the divine. It's just this coarse materialistic mm -hmm. pursuit and desire. Um, and then I worry that, you know, well, if I, if I do find a closer relationship to God that isn't through this work, then how do I, how do I reconcile that with my day to day? Like functionally, this is what, this is all I know how to do. I only know how to make a living through mm -hmm. <laughs> writing and research. Um, and yeah, I, it's funny to think back on it now. Cause that was maybe, maybe like nine months ago. Um, and now I, I can't even remember what why I was so worried. And I don't, I don't know what changed. I don't, if you asked me on the spot, well, why do you still write if you don't have that relationship anymore? I couldn't really tell you. Um, but something did change where I still feel like my life is the same as it was before. It's not like I, I didn't like, yeah, quit and go become a monk somewhere or anything. Like I just, I live my normal life, yeah. but somehow my attitude towards it has, has just changed and I'm not, I'm not sure why. So this sounds like a, Look, I, I, I did a similar joke with Kent, a previous guest on the podcast. Uh, because I wear the, the headset and I have this very peculiar hairstyle, people have been calling me like Joe Rogan. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've watched uh, the Joe Rogan podcast, <laughs> yeah. but it's almost, it's almost mandatory in the Joe Rogan podcast to talk about DMT. So, <laughs> in, in, uh, so here I am talking about DMT in my, in my path to Joe Rogan. But... What you're describing sounds a lot like the what some of the people who take DMT will describe. I mean, I had this experience and, and I saw this different world and they claim it's it's not just an illusion. It's an actual realm that they visit and, and I believe it today. Didn't believe it back then. I believe it today. But after that, my life was different. I just I was a different person. And to, to the point that people research using things like that for th th therapeutical purposes because it really yeah. seems to mess up some people <laughs> but but get other people in a you know it's, it's still me but it's a different me and and you're describing the same thing it, it's just they didn't yeah. take any substance to do it right yeah i've heard this from a number of people um i've i have no experience with dmt myself but i've heard that it's the the descriptions of the genres are very similar to that and i think all these things are just different mm -hmm. ways of getting to that same experience or state or whatever i had a conversation recently with a friend who told me that he had had a, a mystical experience and it, there was no one thing that had occasioned that experience, but he just sort of realized all the things at once and everything he was describing was this, it's the same experience ever, you know, so there, there is some objectivity to it, I think, where there or some consistency, at least across like all these different stories of people that experience in a lot of different ways. Um, and it's fun, like, I guess I, I've been thinking about this recently because for me, it's been a little bit of like a, um, I don't think it's obvious that I would have ended up taking interest in like the jhanas or understanding what's going on in our brains or these altered states. Um, and so it's been, you know, I wrestled with a little bit in the beginning of are people just going to think I'm crazy or something? <laughs> and, uh, and, and people have been a lot more receptive than I expected. Like I've gotten so many messages from people that I would not have expected to hear from saying like, oh, I've had this experience or I'm trying this thing or whatever. Um, and I guess I just, I don't really understand, I don't know if you have thoughts on like, why does this make people so uncomfortable to talk? Like some people are just uncomfortable hearing about this stuff. And I don't really know why, like what is, especially, you know, I kind of get it a little bit with, okay, maybe you're talking about an illegal substance and people are worried about, you know, yeah. 
implications of that but like when it's something like the jhanas like it's just you're literally just thinking your way into the states and i don't know why it just some, some people get sort of like shifty and weird about it um do you have a theory do you have a theory as to why that is no i think maybe some people are just afraid of introspecting or they're afraid of mm -hmm. it is maybe you know like what we were talking about with um with you know notifications and attention and you know yeah. the feeling that maybe you'll discover something that'll upend your life and whatever and and maybe people are afraid of you know for better or for worse the the structure that they have right now is the structure that they know in their life and they don't yeah, want works, a different yeah. life but it is also funny because you know i'm hearing you talk and me talking it's like you know you can also have these experiences and nothing changes i didn't leave my family i didn't quit my job <laughs> I, didn't, I don't feel that anything is different i just like i just think about life a little bit differently now but um I, I don't know why it's so scary to do, do you do you is it more of a foundational thing that changed or do you view yourself as more creative right now, at the moment after these experiences or less creative or um i think what happened after that after the consciousness sort of thing it feels like i just don't think that much about myself anymore in a good way where i just realized that like my body and my mind are not really they're no longer my central point of fixation i'm just like mm -hmm. life is just kind of good you know i just feel like i'm think i'm not really there's nothing really going on in my head of some internal narrative that is you know criticizing or evaluating or questioning or analyzing i'm just sort of very in the zone but i you know i i feel like I'm well, i think i think a lot of people a lot of people would uh feel sad about losing that because to, to a yeah. lot of People, you know, I think myself included in, in, in the early days, this is you, this is what you are, right? The, the questioning, the, you know, this is what I am. So yeah. do, do I lose this? What do I become? It's still yeah. me, but it's, is it is it the me that I want to be? I, I always had a lot of trouble with uh, relinquishing control, which is why I think I am the way I am, right? So just, uh, I've done, I've tried meditation in the past, again, in my, especially my new age phase with crystals and with incense <laughs> and a bunch of stuff. And f funny enough, I had, a, I had a couple of experiences, I think nothing like that, but I had out-of-body experiences and I had things, and I had things that I could make happen at, at some point. Uh, so I do know that those things exist. I just don't, you know, today I, I, I think I would have problems doing it. But um, yeah, I think I, 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 in, in a lot of those experiences, I would feel terrified. Uh, that is the thing that I was trying to do. But when it started happening, I would feel terrified because I was losing control. Mm. And it feels to me that I am that control, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is true for... Um like mental health stuff in general, like, mm -hmm. um, there's a sensation of, oh, if I'm not, if I'm not this depressed person, or if I'm not this anxious person, who, who am I then without, you yep. know, without these same loops that you're used to, the, the same patterns of analysis that you're used to going to. And it's this funny thing, because like, on the one hand, you might say, like, oh, I, I, I wish I weren't depressed, I, I, you know, I would love to be a happier person or not, not experience this numbness all the time. But then, then you lose it. And you're kind of like, well, well, then who am I now? Yeah. Or who am I if I'm not, you know? And so it's, you get this weird Stockholm syndrome attachment to all your own neuroses or your own, um, yeah, your own, your own challenges. Uh, Sounds like a hell. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. just weird because we become like, yeah. you know, in prisons of our own making where it's, yeah. you, you, you want to, you almost don't even want to strive toward the, the door is open and you don't want to leave because you're just like, well, I don't even know what that thing is. But then once you, at least in my experience, you know, I feel like I've gone through a number of these experience in my life and you cross the path and then you realize like it's actually really not that bad um at mm -hmm. least that's been my experience but you know i i also don't want to be prescriptive in saying that that's true for everyone because um I've, as i've been sort of digging into trying to understand the mechanics of like of the jhanas and um some of this concentration meditation i was reading a paper yesterday about um at, uh they were they did all this um interviews and, and research of, into um people that have had adverse experiences while meditating and find this actually very common and um they did these very extensive interviews with with meditators and they they basically separated into two things of um trying to measure the phenomenology of what was going on so just really you know tell me about the sensations you're feeling or tell me about the experiences like just very literal sort of sensory descriptions um 
And then they asked him about their interpretations of it. And the interpretations of the exact same experiences were sometimes perceived as very positive or very negative. And that depended on a whole host of other factors of, you know, the cultural context they're in, their, their own expectations, mm -hmm. their own experiences. And so, I mean, even the experience I had that I described to you about, you know, turning off my consciousness, like, I think that's just an experience in itself. Like, there are a lot mm -hmm. of ways to interpret what happened. And um, maybe I interpreted it as this mystical thing or as a godlike thing because I was sort of, I already was thinking of God as something that can't be defined. And then I was like, oh, this is, this is that. Um, but someone else might experience it and, and have a completely different reaction or, or a negative reaction. Um, so it is, and I think that is, again, why it's, it's, it's really hard to share things that feel like that class of knowledge that is wisdom or things that you've gleaned through experience because your experience is always filtered through so many other things. You can't really tell someone exactly how to do it the way you did. Um, that's just, you know, I feel like if I were to just sort of go off, it's just me feeling good at talking about my own experience, but that doesn't actually help other people because everyone has their own way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that you were raised half in the United States, half in Indonesia, and your family was Christian. You said part of your family, at least in that tradition. My, but what kind of mom, Christian yeah. were they? Was she Catholic? Yeah, I don't or, really, or really know. I always say Catholic Buddhist, and yeah. so I don't know if that's yeah. really correct or not. But so Chinese Indonesians are a, a small minority in Indonesia, and they are more Catholic. Um, um, but I have a feeling it's not Catholic in the same way that like yeah. my friends are Catholic in the U.S. But I always say Catholic, some kind of Christian. <laughs> Because the way you describe this, and again, I'm sorry to anybody who is listening that considers this heretical or, or, or terrible, or I, I have this tendency of going to uncharted places, but the, the way you describe this, this, this experience of the, of the, you say Jana or Jana? Jana's. Jana. The, the way you describe this sounds to me a lot like what some Catholic people in the past would report praying the rosary. So are you are you familiar with how Catholics can pray the rosary? Yeah, with the counting the... Yeah, which again, I, I do. Uh, I try to do almost every day. I wish I did it every day, but some days again, are you I just Catholic? don't. For whatever. I, am, I am Catholic, yes. Uh, again, uh, now now I am. And the, the, way, the way you're supposed to pray the rosary is that you will do a prayer first, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and then you will pray 10 times which I think Protestants hate both because it is the Hail Mary and because it's repetitive. Uh, but you, you will pray that prayer 10 times uh, with the beads, right? Mm -hmm. And why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? You focus on, uh, you're supposed to be meditating. You're supposed to, again, I, I don't because I'm terrible at meditation, uh, but you're supposed to be meditating about uh, some something about the life of Jesus. So the, there are four kinds of mysteries. There is like the luminous mysteries, the joyful mysteries, the glorious mysteries, and the sorrowful mysteries. Uh, and, and then each of them have five things inside them that you can think, for example, the sorrowful mysteries. The first one is uh, uh, the agony in the garden. So if you, you, re you, re you remember about like Jesus in the garden agonizing about the fact that I realized that I'm going to die, but I, but I have to do it anyway. Uh, and, and I have a, a lot of trouble with that because for me, like in, in my crazy hyper analytical mind. If I'm praying this, how am I meditating about this other thing that doesn't work? But but at the same time, as I'm praying, I can start thinking about my job and like those things keep popping out in my mind. And like, what if I go fix this bug now? And what about, you know, what about this other customer that's calling me? And I try to shut that down, but I really can't. So so I don't think I don't think I am doing it the, the way I should be doing. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not. But when you read about people like in, in the Middle Ages and, and the monks uh, and etc. Like I, I think they get to a point that is very similar to what you're describing because you're now trying to feel, and maybe that's what I'm going to try to do next time. You're trying to feel that emotion, not not think about the fact that Jesus was there, but like the crowning of thorns, this the the the, the third sorrowful mystery. Mm -hmm. Maybe you 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 imagine yourself with with that, and then and then you're going to connect with with that feeling. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a very similar process that that you're describing. Yeah, and, and maybe. And, yeah, that's interesting. Because, yeah, it's, I, you know, I hadn't thought about it for decades uh, until you brought up the rosary. But, yeah, I used to, I yeah. used to use the rosary when I was a kid. Um, still remember that now. Yeah, um, so so your family it, was definitely Catholic because Protestants yeah. hate this. this <laughs> most of them, most of them. I, I think some of them are more. Uh, I saw some some Protestant the other day on Twitter saying that, look, you know what? They prayed the rosary and I didn't see anything wrong with that. 
because at the end of the day, it's really just meditation. It uh, is meditative. On, yeah, on, yeah. On, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, as a kid, I mean, and this is why maybe a lot of kids when you're raised religious or you're, you're taught these sort of rituals and rites, they don't mean anything to you because you're just sort of like, yeah. you're just repeating things and you're not, you're like, but why am I doing this? And then the, but why question then propels you into atheism and then you kind of come back around. As you want. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, but I, I really like that. I think that would even be a cool way to teach if you were to like teach a child about it or something of like, you know, feel it and imagine it and really like try to try to embody the experience, not just, you know, oh, I'm listing it off, blah, 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 you know. Yeah. Um, um, I will say, I mean, I guess like, especially with Catholicism, and there, there's definitely types of religions that emphasize more like the tradition and the ritual is the point and it's not really about trying to connect in this deeper emotional way. It's like, you know, it's, it's more about mm -hmm. repeating and reinforcing that structure. So I don't know what the in, in, intent, maybe it is heretical, as you say, to su suggest that, but I think it'd be a really cool way to, to connect. I, I always, I always preface, I don't think it is, but I always preface everything I say with that because like, again, my mind goes to crazy places sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> but, but look, I, I think this is a, uh, the, the experience you're describing. And for me, the, the real problem is this, like that my mind cannot just keep thinking about stuff. And I try mindful meditation. I try it all, you know, just my mind won't yeah. shut up. Uh, I think it just, my mind is like my five-year-old son. Uh, he <laughs> does not ever shut up. Uh, and it's just, I guess it's our personality because right? the guy, he was born like that. He was must born. Must be related. Uh, yeah. But there must, there must be a way, but, but I, I feel like it's very similar at the end of the day, because you have this emotion and you concentrate on this emotion and, and, and you're thinking like, and there's, it's not just sorrow, uh, you know, there's joyful things about like, uh, the, there are the joyful mysteries for that. So like in there, mm. you talk, you think about the joy that it is for Mary to be visited by the angel. Like that is the first one, the Annunciation, but I never truly try to do this by trying to feel that feeling. I, I'm always trying to do this by thinking about what was, what does that mean? for Mary to be visited by the angel, right? Just blah, blah, blah. Right. The, the, I'll, I'll, I'll try the, and I'll report back. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll report <laughs> know, back. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because I think that is, um, and I, this was, I think the first time I really thought about this was in C.S. Lewis's memoir. Um, but he talks about how, I'm going to roughly paraphrase, but he, he's basically saying that, you know, you don't really think your way into happiness. You're, when when he's happy or you're content, it's, it's kind of when there's nothing going on in your mind. Um, and so it kind of just brings into question this, you know, why why do we keep thinking you can like think or logic your way into finding an answer to stuff? Like I used to journal very extensively my whole life. Like I always loved journaling and I love writing, right? Um, but at some point I realized like too much journaling can actually just you get stuck in these loops where you're just mm -hmm. sort of analyzing, analyzing, analyzing. And they say, oh, journaling, you know, is supposed to make you feel better. It can help you process some stuff, but there's a point where you're suddenly just like ruminating and it's actually not not productive at all and what you want to get to is a point where everything kind of just falls away and you're not you're just not really thinking too much about it and it doesn't mean that you're not thinking like you know it doesn't mean like your your brain is blank inside it just means that you're now i feel like i have much more control i mean you talk about desire for control like i feel like i have a lot more control over my brain now than i did before because now i'm just like mm -hmm. okay i've got my task at hand I'm, I'm i'm doing the task i'm talking to a person i'm talking to the person there's no longer this like second layer of what is this person thinking? Did I say that correctly? And you know, all this stuff, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. you just be. <laughs> no, be in the moment, right? Which is a lot of people, I, 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 I swear to you that I can't do this uh, for now, for now, maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> we'll change yeah. it. But like, a, uh, I, I don't even understand sometimes when people say be in the moment, like uh, for me, I have to be thinking about stuff all the time. Right? Yeah. This, this is, this is super interesting. Do you, is there like a physical position that is better to do uh, this or not or like does it matter have you seen people how do you how do you uh, do this on, on the... i think it's taught in a lot of different ways but i really liked about yeah. the company that i i did the retreats yeah. with was um they're very they teach it from a you know non-denominational pragmatic sort of perspective and mm -hmm. so they're kind of like do whatever is fun and do whatever feels easy so i always just did it lying in bed <laughs> um just on my yeah. back and sitting because i mean i yeah I, I tried sitting and meditating in the past it's just it's so uncomfortable. You, you know what I, I i don't like to sit and then yeah. uh, all of the guided meditations that i tried in in the past they so i sit down etc and then i never do and i always lay down and i kept telling myself that the reason i fail is because i'm laying down but then i don't <laughs> go try sitting down i don't know why you know just you see this this day yeah, it's like people are funny 
yeah. I went on like a zen retreat, like a, you know, ten years ago or whatever, and and it was a very different style of teaching. And you know, you're and that was where I remember you're sitting there and you're sitting there for hours, cross legged, and your legs are going numb and your back is hurting. Like, oh my gosh, it was just so uncomfortable. And the teachers are telling you, like, you know, well, what does the suffering feel like? And you know, engage with it in the moment. And I'm just saying, be like, but I don't like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I still like, I think that's part of why I like the concentration type meditation is because I like being very zeroed in on a task at any given time. Like even when I'm like, I can't, I don't enjoy just like watching TV in my own time. I just, I get, it's just, I need to be like dialed in actively into something at all times. Um, and so I, I like that with that. It's, it's a little bit more goal oriented where you're, you're really just trying to focus on an object. And so my brain has something to do because otherwise I, I, I don't enjoy mindfulness meditation. I don't enjoy the sit with your breath and I can't, I can't do that. Like, I don't, <laughs> uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. No, I, I had problems with meditation as well, which is like, I, sometimes I say people think I don't even, I'm not even making sense, but I don't think I know how to breathe. Uh, <laughs> and, and people are, just breathe. Don't, you know, don't force it. It's impossible for me. Like I, I, I I'm how thinking about breathe? it. I, will, how, I don't know, but when I'm trying to breathe in meditation, like I, I breathe in, and then sometimes, like, I never breathe out at the right time. And then I start thinking that I'm hyper, I start hyperventilating and et cetera. <laughs> so all of those things, they have to breathe in a specific way. Uh, again, I, I, I tried many, many times, but I'm out already in, in, in the first minute. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that, that's tough. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Like, an, yeah, I, it does. I, I have, I keep thinking one day I'm going to find somebody that does not think I'm crazy, that knows what I'm talking about, and they're going to teach me the right way to do it. There has, there has to be a right way to do it. But uh, I start hyperventilating. I start hyperventilating. I've never, I've never heard of anybody else that reports the same thing that I do. Yeah, that's so strange. I wonder yeah. how you breathe when you're like not thinking about your breathing. I guess you, well, yeah, you know, but when I start yeah. when I start wondering, then 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 it's that's whatever when you start right, just exactly. yeah, You yeah, can't yeah. know. <laughs> Because yeah. people say just just breathe. They say, "Yeah, easy for you to say." Like I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm no now just by telling you that I'm already conscious, right? And, 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 <laughs> Start a hyperventilating. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure, there's a teacher out yeah. there for you somewhere who who knows how to deal with it. But but look, Sam Harris. Are you familiar with Sam Harris? Yeah. Sam Harris is a, again famously an, an atheist. He's one of the, the the top ones from from that crowd and. Uh, he meditates a lot. So meditation is not necessarily a religious thing. Yeah, definitely not. You, 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 how, how, how do you view that? Because for you, it was one of the things that, if I understood Push, you correctly, yeah. not, not put you in this path, but open the, it was the last step by opening this window, right? But, but, yeah. but, all, but on the other hand, you seem to be also very aware that this is all just something that your body does. Yeah, it's not I, a so I, supernatural I only, thing. I think I only realized so I did I did two retreats basically, and I didn't practice it otherwise. Um, and so the first one, so basically there, there are these like eight states I mentioned, and then the, the ninth state is when you turn off your consciousness. Um, and so for the first eight states, uh, it's a very different kind of experience. And the first three ish states, let's say maybe first three or four, um, are very embodied and uh, and all the benefits that people talk about it's it's all it's all really about like you and your body and your mind where you know you now know how to um you know nudge your brain into a state of euphoria or a state of calm and peace and uh, and so when i came away from that first retreat i i was just sort of like oh cool i have a set of tools now with which to manipulate my mind basically so if i'm feeling anxious i can figure out how to sort of redirect my energy and focus and now i feel this other thing um and so I, I totally get how, you know, none of that ever really comes at odds with the like atheism or, um, or faith or, or whether God exists or not, because it's all, it's all, um, uh, it's all presented as things that are beneficial for your body and your mind. And you have this attachment to like making, making my mind as good as it can possibly be. Um, and I, yeah, I don't really know how to explain it, but after the second retreat, when I, then when I kind of had the more like mystical experience and, and, and grappled with my own consciousness. Then I had a, I just came away with like a completely different takeaway, which was, oh, none of this stuff actually matters. And I can't tell you really why or how that happened, but now I have no desire to really practice those other lower states because I don't really, I don't, I just don't really think about my mind anymore. It's, it's just good all the time. Um, and so, yeah, you know, yeah, you know who you remind me of? 
You know who you mm. remind me of by, by saying that? Like, I don't know yeah. if you watched, uh, we seem to have a bit of a relatively similar age because you came to your mm. atheism about the same time as me. Mr. Miyagi, you know, Mr. Miyagi? <laughs> yeah, wax on, wax off. Yeah, exactly. Because he's talking <laughs> about those things about you with the purpose of karate is to not fight, right? So, but, yeah. but, if, you, but if you don't know karate, then then you, you're you not not fighting. But now that you know, you not fight. So, like, it, it's a similar thing. Like, I, I, oh, I know this stuff. So, if I... I don't. I don't have the need anymore, right? Just uh, because uh, I you, you you learn karate. Yeah, Ooh, I like that connection. That's uh, I gotta yeah. rewatch that movie. That's... <laughs> uh, Co Co Cobra Cobra Kai is uh, my favorite nostalgia series because I think they did it right. Most <laughs> people trying to bring like this nostalgia back, they completely butchered the original. Like I I don't know if you watch Cobra Kai or not. I loved mm -hmm. it. They had, I think they're gonna have their their last season starting in July now. I'm dying to what watch is that. Cobra Kai. It, it's the story. It starts as the story from the point of view of Johnny, the guy that the, that is uh, Daniel's bully, uh -huh. and and from his perspective, Daniel Larusso was the bad guy, <laughs> uh, and 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 now he now you know Daniel Larusso as a, as a, he became like a wealthy man, he did well in life, and like Johnny, his life was went to complete disarray. Oh, that's so sad. Uh, but just, but just it's fantastic. Yeah, I gotta I watch it. I, mean, right. it just, I gotta do a whole marathon then. I gotta watch. Yeah, Daddy exactly. Kid. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 then and then I rewatched all the Karate Kid movies because of the first season of Cobra Kai. So I watch it like yeah. with a new with a new mindset. And they're gonna have the last season now starting in July. I've been waiting for for a while because they stopped yeah. during COVID, right? But just uh, so they got late. But super excited to watch. But again, we went on a complete tangent here. But but that's it. Reminds me of that because that's exactly what he's talking about, right? Like you didn't you. It's not it's not a thing. It's he's not telling you don't learn karate. Learn it, but not and and he he says that knowing that you will learn because you want to fight, but he's trying to teach you the whole time that like the it's not about it at some matter. point you have to understand that it's not about fighting. Like a, yeah, you have to do learn it, but don't fight it. And it doesn't make yeah. any sense from from in 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 Daniel's mind, right? Yeah, it, it, and I tell totally, like it makes no sense until now I get it, but I didn't get it <laughs> until very yeah. recently. Um, but yeah, it's like I, there is something very yeah coarse or materialistic in in thinking about like oh all these benefits to my mind versus like what if your mind just doesn't really matter that much anymore? Um. That is deep. If I fail, uh, who can help me with that task? I will. I, I promise you, I will try. Yeah. <laughs> is there Great. anything that you is there anything that you recommend? Any like you mentioned this retreat or just the, what um, are the options? Yeah. Uh yeah, there's there are a bunch of different types of um different schools of thought that teach the teach the jhanas. The only one that I believe that is, approaches it from a more secular non non-Buddhist um tradition is Journey, which is the company that mm -hmm. taught me the jhanas. Um and then yeah, I have a I wrote up that blog post with instructions um, uh, that some people have found useful. So yeah, that would be my, that's the fastest way I think to experience, but um, yeah. Awesome. Nadia, it was an absolute pleasure uh, chatting with you about that today. I look, uh, I hope you had a blast as, as well. I certainly yeah, did. Yeah, super fun. Let's Thanks keep in touch. Thanks the time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye and stream.